What's up guys, welcome back to the channel, Gary McCready from HVAC Know It All. If you guys are enjoying the content here, please like, subscribe for more HVAC content coming your way. So what we're gonna do on this video, what I'm gonna set up for you here, is the first dual fuel system that I've installed, basically consisting of a Lennox furnace and a heat pump, right? So basically the Lennox furnace is the backup, is the alternate or auxiliary heat, and the heat pump is the primary heat. This is a King Home heat pump, and we did this for the distributor. I didn't record the video. They recorded it and did, did the editing and it was for them, okay? So, but I'm putting it on the channel because it's got some educational points in it. This was the first install I did of a furnace slash heat pump. Now, as the video goes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop in and just explain a couple of things here and there just to clarify what's going on in the video. I'm Gary McCready from McCready HVAC and Refrigeration. So what we're doing today is installing a dual fuel heat pump system. We have our Lennox furnace and our heat pump A coil right here that sits on the top. This is a case coil. Anytime you want to put in a heat pump, you want to match it up with a case coil because it looks way cleaner than trying to install an A coil in the duct system above the, the furnace itself. So anytime you can, get a case coil because it looks much cleaner and it's a much easier install. We're also installing a filter rack with a five inch filter. It's a media filter and that prevents a lot of bypass, particulate bypassing around the filter. What we're doing here is removing the return drop. The entire return drop is coming out. The reason we're doing that is because we want a bigger return here because we have an ECM motor and we have high duct static originally when we first tested the system before we removed it. So with the high duct static, because we had the high duct static with a one inch filter, that's why we're putting the five inch filter, more airflow, and we're going to increase the size of this return plenum to have more return air and a better airflow through the system to reduce that static pressure within the return duct. You'll see later in the video me setting up the airflow with the static pressure tips with my dual port manometer. I went in early to the job with the old setup still there and did an assessment of the duct static, meaning the supply and the return basically when you put it together is your total external static pressure. Now I wanted to see how high it was. They were using a one inch filter. The return duct was a little bit smaller than what we put in. So it's always good to go in when you're doing your assessment and make sure that you're checking these things because you might need to make some modifications. So one thing you want to do before you start any install when you're changing over a furnace and an AC to a heat pump slash furnace or even heat pump slash electric heat strips is you're going to want to do a load calculation on the home, speak to a local designer and have your heat loss and the heat gain calculations done for you before you go on and select the size of the equipment you're using. The system we're doing here, because you don't want to run the heat pump and the furnace at the same time, typically, generally speaking, you're going to want to size that furnace to handle the heating load of the home. So if the heat pump can't keep up or it fails for some reason, the furnace is there as a backup or as an alternative or as auxiliary to heat the home and it's sized correctly to that heat loss of the home. Our heat pump is mounted on the side of the home here. And if you're going to mount it on the side of the home, make sure that you're going into uh, brick or concrete. You don't want to go into the side of a home if it's siding because you can have a lot of vibration. In that case, you want to put it on a stand that sits away from the home. But because this is concrete, we, we should be good here. Now, this rector seal bracket that we used is good for up to 500 pounds. The other thing we got to do is cut our bolts off to make it have a, a cleaner look here and the spec in the manual for the distance from the wall is about four inches and we've got about six here so we've got good clearance there. So they got the foam pads underneath here and they've got a piece on the bottom that allows you to thread the bolt straight into and all the bolts and stuff come with the kit so that's why I like these rector seal brackets. Just let me take a quick minute from the video guys and explain to you how I'm utilizing Jobber. Jobber is the CRM tool that I'm using to run McCready HVAC and refrigeration services. The company that I'm utilizing to install this heat pump job right here. So I invoice that job through Jobber. Okay, so the way Jobber works, it's a CRM tool, basically customer relationship management tool. And you can invoice, you can quote, you can schedule, you can do all kinds of things coming from the commercial world with a team and then going into being basically a one man show running McCready HVAC. This tool has been super valuable to me and I can't say 
enough about it because it's helped me run this business and help me be profitable. So if you guys are interested in checking out Jobber, I will leave a link in this YouTube video at the bottom so you guys can go check it out. We're gonna mount the disconnect on the wall here and then feed our whip from the disconnect into the electrical here and that will be our next step. So what we've done here so far is install the furnace and the filter cabinet and we have fastened in our gas line. What we chose to do here was use some gas tight. Just make sure to look up the code and make sure you're putting it into code. We use some gas tight because our pipeline moving down and the pipeline here with the furnace didn't match up. So the gas tight is a good product when you have this kind of setup. So make sure you put your drip pocket in and also a union as well because you wanna crack the union here to remove it and not the gas tight where possible. So today what we're gonna be doing is piping in our case coil. We're going to be cutting our venting back and installing our venting to the furnace. And here's our drain off the furnace. This particular Lennox comes with this kit here. And what you want to do, and it's in the manual, is you want to have a standpipe that comes off the vent that is no more than two inches above the outlet here. And we came across, installed it into our drain. What we're also going to do is cut in a neutralizer, a condensate neutralizer right here. That's really important because these high efficiency furnaces, what happens is they produce acidic condensate. So this the acidic condensate can actually start to eat away metal, metal drain materials and anything that is metal like this grill right here. So it's very important to install a condensate neutralizer on a high efficiency heating appliance. We're going to install our return drop here into the furnace. We have our ductwork and our fittings all ready to go. And we're also going to pipe in our A-coil going right outside the cavity right there. So inside the heat pump, what we have is a couple of flared connections. We got three eighths and three quarter. The nuts are provided, they're already there. So you just gotta take the nuts off and you have to flare your piping. What I would suggest is you use a flaring tool with a pipe stop that does a 45 degree angle flare and it works really, really well. I like to use Nylog on my flare seat some people like to use POE oil instead. Some people like to use nothing, but make sure your flare is good. It's also recommended you look in the manual and look at the torque specs and use a torque wrench to torque your nuts as well. So this is three quarter inch pipe and it's really hard to manipulate in one fluid run from the outdoor unit to the coil, right? You can end up kinking the pipe if you're not careful. So if you have to do any braze joints, what I would suggest is you do one joint instead of a coupling, you can use a swage tool or a tubing expander. And the other thing you need to do is hook up your nitrogen tank and purge nitrogen as you're brazing. If you don't purge nitrogen as you braze, the inside of the pipe will accumulate the carbon that you're seeing here and can get clogged in the TX valve and any sort of valves and capillary tubes that are in the system. So you always have to nitrogen braze because it will prevent the buildup of carbon inside the pipe. The other thing I suggest you do with the three quarter is use a tubing bender. Instead of 90s, you can use a tubing bender and you can get nice bends and try to get them nice and round. Instead of trying to do it by hand, you do it by hand, you're gonna kink it. Most likely you're gonna put kinks in, in the piping. So I would suggest you use a tubing bender, a good one, and bend your tubing rather than try to use 90s or try to do it by hand. Something I've learned here because you gotta bend your three quarter, right? And you might have to make some connections in between both indoor and outdoor unit. I really don't like the pre-insulated stuff for that reason, because you gotta cut it off and it's harder to put back on. So in future, I think I'd rather go with an uninsulated line set and insulate it myself because you know, the black stuff, the Armaflex stuff, well, I like the K-Flex Titan, which is similar to that white stuff, but a lot more user-friendly. I think it would be easier to slide it on afterwards after you, you manipulate your three quarter inch piping with your bends and any connection points in the way because that white stuff really is a lot harder to put back on after the fact. Now one thing that you're gonna wanna do after your piping is complete, after your flares are done, after all your braze joints are done, if you have any, you're gonna wanna run a pressure test and you know you wanna hold pressure for quite some time before you go and pull a vacuum. I like to pressure test between 4 and 500 PSI. If your pressure test is not holding, you're going to have to go soap your joints. If your pressure test holds for an hour or so, 
then you should be good. You shouldn't have to leak soap your joints at that point. But if you see a drop in pressure as you're pressure testing, pull out your liquid soap and leak test all your joints. So after the pressure test is done and your pressure test has held, you're gonna to wanna to set up your vacuum pump. What I do is I don't use gauges. I go from the system straight to the pump with a large diameter hose and I use valving. So we can use a valve there and a ball valve here. That way we can isolate the system afterwards when we open up the valves. So the refrigerant is not leaving the system. It's staying isolated with these ball valves and then we take our valves off afterwards. You wanna get down to at least 500 microns. We're down at 34.2. And the other thing that you wanna do is make sure that your evacuation holds. Close the ball valve here. We're gonna isolate the pump from the system with the ball valve. But our valve for our micron gauge is still open, so our micron gauge is still monitoring system pressure. You wanna make sure that your micron gauge does not rise. If it rises, you may have a leak. If it rises, you may also have more evacuation to do because you still have some contaminants in there, some moisture, some air. So you wanna make sure that your evacuation holds and it holds for a few minutes on a small system like this before you go ahead and open up the valves. So before you start your heat pump, what I suggest you do is set up your fan CFM, which is in this cabinet on the little jumpers. It's in the Lennox manual. And once you set up your fan for the application you're using, you need to check your external static pressure. This is the total external static pressure of the machine. Now this particular Lennox is asking for a maximum of 0.8 inches water column. So we're bang on our maximum. We don't want to go any higher than that. And the way we do this is with a couple of static pressure tips. One in the return. This is the return cabinet down here. And I was able to get it through the other static pressure tip through the screw hole in the bottom of the case coil. We just gotta put a screw back in there when we're done. And the static pressure tips basically look like this. They are rounded on the tip and they have holes in the side so they catch the ballooning effect of the duct system external to the cabinet. So very important because if we go higher with our external static pressure, we can cause damage to our ECM motor and we may not be able to perform well when we're in heat pump mode, cooling mode, etc. So I actually went back to the drawing board on this one and I went into the furnace and I changed my CFM settings. I actually lowered it, which lowered my static pressure, okay? My static pressure dropped to about 0.65 or something like that. So it was actually lower than the 0.8 down to 0.65. And it actually ran really, really well when I started it up at that setting. So you're gonna have to play around with that and make sure your static pressure and your CFM are in line with each other. And you're not really going above that external, total external static pressure maximum rating that the air handler wants you to see. Here's the control wiring down at the furnace. And this is a two stage Lennox furnace, two stage heat. Okay, so you can get away with six wires, but we have seven here. Fortunately, there was enough wires to run this. If there's not, you're, you might have to run some extra wires on your job. So we have single stage heating, two stage heating, so W1, W2, our common, our R, G, our cooling, and this is the O wire. So we have seven wires in total. You can get away with six with this furnace because there's a jumper here that allows the second stage of heating to come on on a time delay, five or 10 minutes. So you can get away with six wires, but we have seven. So going out to the outdoor unit, the heat pump, is this wire, right here and there's four wires going out to the heat pump and those four wires are common r y and o those go out to the heat pump in this particular application what i recommend you do with extra wires is wrap them don't cut them off just wrap them just in case you ever have a conductor that fails or gets pinched, you have extra conductors here on your wire rather than cutting them off. Just wrap them around and keep them there for future use if need be. Here's our wiring configuration outside. We have our Y attached to Y downstairs. Here's our B attached to the O downstairs at the furnace. Our R and our C. Pretty self-explanatory on this one. So this is what your control wiring setup will look like outside. One thing of importance is we need to make sure that the disconnect is on for 
at least eight hours or so before we start the machine up. So what you can do is just make sure none of the control wires are connected up, turn the main disconnect on, make sure we have our proper power at the inlet here and the board powers up. This way our crankcase heater will be on and will avoid any potential issues with liquid in the compressor when we go to start the machine up. So we're looking at the sub base of the Ecobee thermostat. Here is what your wire configuration should look like. We're wired to G, C, Y1, OB, RC, W1, and W2. When you first turn on your thermostat, it will recognize the connections that you've inputted and it will bring you through the heat pump setup. So you're gonna to have to get the manual out and look through the heat pump setup to see how it's configured. I'll show you some of them right now. So if we go into the menu and settings here and we scroll to settings here, we can look at the install settings for the equipment and we are uh, heat pump two stage with auxiliary furnace. So that's really important. Here are the thresholds right here. Ecobee gives you some recommendations as you're setting it up, what you should set them to. And a lot of these are default. Some of them have been changed, but again, make sure you read the manual and go over this. So we have disabled the compressor at 9.4 minus 9.4 degrees Celsius. So basically the heat pump won't run below that temperature. In this specific instance, we chose to go with around the, the minus 10 Celsius mark as an experiment. So the winter's kind of winding down and we probably won't see that temperature again this winter, but the homeowner really wants to push this thing to the limit. So next winter, I think they'll bump that down to maybe minus 15 or something and just see how that heat pump outside responds. The product, it's a Gree product. And I'm telling you right now, I've installed a bunch of their, their heat pumps in the mini split fashion. And these things are built solid and they run really, really well. Our auxiliary savings optimization is set at 1.6. And basically what this does is it keeps the indoor temperature within 1.6 degrees of the set point. But again, with the Ecobee, it's best that you read the instructions, go through them one by one. But as I said, once it senses the wire configuration for heat pump and two stage furnace, what it will do is it'll give you the setup parameters one by one for those. Just look in the manual and set them up for what the manual says it should be for the specific application. Guys, thank you for hanging out on this one. If you, if you like the video, please subscribe and, and like and comment and all that kind of stuff. Now, this job went well because from the planning stage to the install to the startup, everything was thought out ahead of time. We planned it out, right? Um, the Ecobee went in and the manual was read and, and there was some diagrams put together already from Andy Ireland, who is one of the distributors of the King Home product. Their information is there at the end of the video. So you can see he provided the diagram for me right from the Ecobee to the Lennox, then out to the actual King Home heat pump. Everything, like I said, from planning to install to start up went great. And I'm getting nothing but good feedback from the homeowners on how well the heat pump is performing. But I'm out, guys. Happy HVACing.